my identical twin brother, Encore. Doc says he'll be back to normal next week. Come on, Cindy. We've got a date. 11.30 to 12.30 on Sunday. I'm so excited. Let's go. I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors on the team. Welcome to worship. It's so good to be gathered together this morning. If this is your first time, a special welcome to you. Throughout this season of Lent, we have been receiving communion each week together. And so today we have two different options. First, we'd love to see you at drive through Communion right after service today from 1130 to 1230. You can just come through the Pine Lake Covenant Church campus to receive communion. Or if you're not able to make it there today, we will have a time at the very end of service after the announcements where we can receive around a table together digitally. And so at this time, Kairos Kids, I invite you to find all the supplies that you'll need for the Kairos Kids moment. And together, may we center ourselves on the hope that God's faithfulness is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Good morning, Pine Lake Covenant Church. I'm June Rep. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, 
We ask you to make your presence known to each of us during the service today. Be with our pastors and guide their hearts, minds, and words as they share your word with us. Open our ears to hear you loud and clear, and open our hearts. Lord, during these times of divisiveness and polarization, we ask you to help us create unity among our church, our community, and your world. Help us to follow your light and show us how to care for others in your world. As Glenn Campbell put it so succinctly, let me be a little kinder, let me be a little blinder to the faults of those about me. Let me praise a little more. Let me be a little meeker with the brother that is weaker. Let me think more of my neighbor and a little less of me. We pray that you will open our eyes to others and their needs and take away our selfish human desires that color our beliefs and actions. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Help us live these words each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
and I'm on staff here at Pine Lake Covenant Church. And if you're newer to our church, we would love to connect with you. So just grab your phone and text the word WELCOME to 425-249-3838. This will just open up a line of communication and let you know a little bit more about us and if we're the right fit for you. Good morning, I'm Pastor Nancy, and it's time for our Kairos Kids Moment. Preschoolers, elementary students, come a little bit closer and make sure you have your ordinary people of God coloring book. This week, we're learning about Jonah, who was an ordinary person of our extraordinary God. Now, Jonah heard from God, and God said, go to Nineveh. I want you to make me known there. And Jonah knew about the Ninevites, and they were a rowdy bunch, and he really didn't want to go there. 
So he immediately went the other direction. He went to a port, got on a boat, and started to sail for Tarshish, the exact opposite direction of what God told him to do. Now, as he started out on that boat, the waves started to get really rocky and a storm came up and the other people on the boat started crying out. They didn't know what to do. They said, who is to blame for this? And eventually they went down below where Jonah was and said, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you on here? Is this your fault? And he answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them. And they said, what have you done? The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? And Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And they didn't really want to do that because they thought that might dishonor God. But eventually, as the waves got wilder and the sea got rougher, they threw Jonah overboard. Now, Jonah didn't stay in the water very long by himself. God sent a whale to pick him up, to scoop him up. It says God provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And there he stayed for one, two, three days and three nights. And during this time, Jonah turned back to God and prayed to him. Now, as a family, I encourage you to open up your Bible to Jonah chapter 2 and read Jonah's prayer there. It's really beautiful of how he turned back to God. And eventually, after those three days, the Lord commanded the fish to spit Jonah back out onto dry land. And then the word came to Jonah a second time. And God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, a lot of times, just like Jonah, we hear from God or know what we should do. And we say, who, me? I'm not qualified. That makes me a little uncomfortable. No, I don't want to do that. So we do things our own way and go our own direction. And just like God redirected Jonah, God will redirect us. Sometimes it can be frustrating or painful, but we probably won't be swallowed up by a fish like this. But God will redirect us because God wants to be in relationship with us and wants to work through us to make him known to all people. So he will redirect us, course correct where we've gone off course a little bit. Now, as Jonah went through Nineveh, God gave him the words to speak. Sometimes, too, when God asks us to do something, we think, oh, my goodness, I have to come up with a plan and the right words, and I have to figure all this out on my own. But we don't because we're just ordinary people. But God is an extraordinary God who gives us the words to speak and shows us actions we can do so that we can love our neighbors. So just as Jonah proclaimed God's word, the Ninevites turned from their ways. Even the king said, pause, pause what you're doing. Let's fast, let's pray, let's turn to God. And the same can be true for us. We can turn back to God and we can trust that he will redirect our steps. Isn't that amazing? God is so good like that. Friends, let's pray. I've opened up my prayer ring here that we can pray for our family, that we can pray that we will share the love of Jesus with others and trust that God will give us the right words to speak as we share him with others around us. All right, wave some fingers here, some here, clap them, clap them two more times and pull them in. Jesus, thank you for this lesson about Jonah that reminds us that we can turn back to you at any time, that you are always there for us. And even when we're going our own way, you will course correct us. You will redirect us so that we come back to you and stick close to you. Lord, help us in that. And as we share you with our family, give us the right words to speak, God. Let us make you known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, friends. Let's go ahead and grab our rock walls. This is that marker of the space and time where God has been active in our lives. We can even remember some of those times where he's redirected us. I know I've had some tasks I didn't want to do and I put off, but God said, 
now. Now's the time. And I'm grateful because he brought the right words and he helped me have the right conversations with others. So maybe he's done that for you as well. Uh, also, we add rocks when we share our remember verse because God loves it when we hide his word in our heart. We have a new remember verse for this month. So here's a friend to share it with us and let's all say this together. Hi, my name is Gabrielle. Hi, my name is Emmanuel. This week's remember verse is from the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6. Let's say this together. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, oh you are my portion, and you are my hiding place, I believe you are.
Pastor Sharon here. Just some reminders as you consider your giving this morning as we continue in our worship. I've been thinking about the unparalleled generosity of God. Even this past week, think through the gifts that you've seen from him, the natural world we enjoy, the resources we've been given, the relationships that bless our lives, even our very breath, all given from God's generous heart. And because he has freely given, we are invited to also freely give. Thank you for so many of you who have invested in the mission of God through Pine Lake Covenant Church through your generous gifts. You can give this day or during the week in several ways. You can give online at plcc.org slash give or text any amount to 725-444-9494. You can also drop off a check or mail it to the church. Our open office hours are Monday through Thursday, 930 to 1130. Let's give generously to a God who's given generously to us. Let's pray together. Lord, we, we can't outgive you. Everything we have is generously given for our benefit and for our good. And so we make choices this day to joyfully give back to the work that you're doing through your church in this community. We thank you for the privilege of this kind of worship. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning, Pastor Sharon here. Today, we're welcoming somebody new to our team for a time. As you know, we're in this time of transition with Pastor Jedediah um, moving on to a new call. And so in this interim time, we have um, called on Mike Best to help in our areas of worship ministry. And so Mike is going to begin, is beginning this week. What you see on the screen is part of his work. As we Hooray! Can say, Yay! Yeah, it'll be good that we can see online worship and experience God in fresh ways. So I wanted you to meet Mike Best. He's um, connecting with us remotely, not right in our community, but in our state. Um, and this morning, wanted to just ask him the three questions we've asked others during this community highlight. So here you go, Mike. You ready? Uh, I'm ready, ready as I'll ever be. So tell us, what's something fun that you've done recently? Uh, recently, my oldest son, who is 21, came to me and said, Dad, I need to get more organized. And I know that my brain somewhat works like yours. And so could you help me make an organizer like you have? And I had to redo mine anyway, because it was falling apart. And so he and I created these little clipboards with a spiral binding, and I use all kinds of uh, what do you call them? Post-it notes and and tabs and everything. I haven't filled it all the way out yet, but um, that was just a blast to do with my son. Um, although it took forever to get done because I don't have all the tools at my house. <laughs> that's it. That's one definition of fun, but I like it. I like it. Yeah, it was fun. So question two, what's something you're learning? Um, this feels a little cliche, but definitely patience. Um, uh, you know, months and months of living. Uh, we've got uh, three teenagers that live with us and being in our house and all the stresses that go with that. I'm just learning about um, take more time to answer, um, slower words. Uh, there's something in the Bible about that somewhere. It sounds pretty basic. It's, it's a verse that I memorized when I was a little kid, but I think we just keep relearning these things. And that is definitely what's something that God's doing in my life right now. You're right. There's a lot of learning in COVID in different Boy, ways. oh boy. So final question, a good way to end perhaps, something you're grateful for. Well, I would say two things. Um, I am really grateful for God's provision for today and for this week. Um, there's just so much about COVID and certainly what's things that are going on in my family that uh, we, it's in some ways can't plan a whole lot more than today and this week. And God has provided what we need this week. 
And the second thing I'm really grateful for is the internet, because it allows us to do this kind of thing, not just this interview, but we can participate in worship together um, remotely. Uh, I know there's a lot of churches that are doing things remotely and in person, and it, I'm just so grateful for the for the internet. Yesterday, I, I downloaded and printed up four lead sheets, and we're doing an arrangement of something for another project that Heidi and I, my wife Heidi and I are working on. And I, you know, I took me 10 minutes, and I was like, oh, I love to live in the future. I'm so grateful for that. We are grateful for that too. I mean, who would have thought during COVID that we would all just be so grateful for this, need this tool so much. Totally. So Mike, we're grateful you're on board with us. Um, at least for the next several weeks, you'll be part of this. And then we wanted the congregation to know who's behind the scenes and maybe Hello, everyone. in front of the scenes. Yeah. Good to have you here. Thanks. Great Mike. to be here. Thank you, Pastor Sharon. Good morning. My name is Chris Lynn. I'm a student at East Lake High School. Today's reading is from John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Verily, truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes out ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All those who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Good morning, everyone. Pastor Sharon here. It's good to be together again around word, worship, in this space, recognizing God's with us, he meets us here. You know, March is on us, first Sunday in March, and we have this sense of anticipation because spring is right around the corner, and that's a gift for all of us. Starting to see trees and flowers begin to blossom, it's a reminder that life renews, life comes back from what looked like death into something beautiful. You know, we've been in this Lenten series, and Lent is a time where we look from death to life. Our Lenten series is called, I Am, Stories and Statements of Jesus from the Book of John. You know, every time Jesus used that term, I am, he was attributing and making a claim that he was himself God. You might remember that that was the word that God told Moses from the burning bush, who should I say sent me? Moses asked, and he, God says, I am who I am. So Jesus takes this claim for himself. And as we've been looking through these statements, we can see that we get a better picture of who God is. You know, whether consciously or not, we all have certain pictures of God in our mind, certain attributes that come to the forefront. And as we've been going through this I Am series, we're also looking at the way that Jesus has been portrayed through art, across the centuries, through various cultural lenses. What is Jesus like? Well, in this untitled work by an Ethiopian artist, we see Jesus and his disciples at the table at the Last Supper. Neil Sabonia, who's a Professor Emeritus at PLU in Tacoma says this, there's a small industry of painters in, in Ethiopia who make biblical settings like these for the tourist market. And you might just notice as you look at this, the facial features of Jesus and the disciples. Jesus is seen as bread of life, a companion, a friend, but it's in the context of the Ethiopian Masob, it's that basket dining service you see in the picture. And you also see the local custom 
of taking bread with the right hand. A beautiful picture, a, a contextual picture of Jesus. And however we picture him, it comes back to what he says about himself and how he relates to humanity. And so that's the striking feature of every of the I am statements we're going through. Jesus relating to us, divine to human. And what does he say about himself? And will we listen? Will we listen? You know, I've been reflecting about our current political, cultural climate, even religious climate in our own churches, where we're asking, can a leader be trusted? Can we trust what they say? And as we at Pine Lake begin looking for a new lead pastor, we're looking for someone as well whose words and life demonstrate trustworthiness. So whether it's for politicians or professors or pastors, we can rightfully ask the question, is what they say true? Are their words self-serving or are they engaged for the purpose of others? And when we look back at them, are there, are there promises? Can they, are there integrity in what they say? The question really is, whose voice can you trust? So as we look at the text for this day, the I am statement for this day, we are going to ask again, who is this Jesus? And can we really trust him? So today you heard read in the gospel from John, Jesus describing himself in shepherding language. Now, when we talk about sheep and shepherds, most of us don't have an immediate context that comes to mind. But for Jesus' hearers in that day, they had both the physical example of shepherds in their, in their vicinity and also the pictures from the Old Testament, the concept they had heard written in the prophets of God as shepherd, the caretaker for his people. So let's just look a little bit at that Old Testament context before we come to Jesus' words. You know, leaders and kings in the Old Testament were often pictured as shepherds. It's particularly explicit through the writings of the prophet Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 34, he speaks about, well, he speaks actually against the shepherds of Israel. Because at that time, the priests and the leaders were only in it for themselves. They didn't really care for the rest of the people, for the flock. And so the Lord says that these shepherds are going to be removed and the Lord himself will provide. Hear this from Ezekiel 34, verse 2. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? And then later in verse 11 and 12. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his, after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. You see in this passage from Ezekiel that some so-called leaders are not to be trusted both the prophets and the psalmist paint pictures of different types of shepherds, those that care for their people, care for their flocks, and the, those are only in it for themselves. You remember, I'm sure, Psalm 23, this beautiful, familiar passage that talks about the Lord as a shepherd, the Lord who guides and guards his sheep. And the necessary characteristics of a shepherd in Palestine is constant vigilance, courage and patient care for the sheep. So Jesus takes these images from his context and from the Old Testament and has this polemic against the Jerusalem priestly leadership. And in this John 10 passage, it's a richly layered extended metaphor about sheep. We see in it that God, Jesus relates to humanity, us as part of his sheepfold. 
So if you have your Bibles, the passage that was read for us from John chapter 10, I invite you to open it again, either your digital copy or in print. And let's take a look at what Jesus says about himself in this I am statement. You know, similar to the parables that Jesus told, these pictures of shepherding aren't really supposed to be equations. You can't just say, well, this equals that, and I get a complete picture of Jesus' identity through this. No, we can't just assign meaning to every little part of the metaphor. But instead, I invite you to come into this story as, as if Jesus were painting a picture. In his figure of speech, as it says in verse 6, what does he want us to see about himself? Well, the first image that comes to mind is a man who enters by the gate. If you take a look in verses 2 to 5, you'll see this image come forth. Now, Jesus here is probably referring to this communal sheepfold, a place that just has one door, and a shepherd would bring his flock into this community space, all the shepherds in the area, and then they'd have a hired watchman who would keep track of them through the night, um, stay there to guard at the door. And in the morning, every shepherd would come to gather his own sheep to head out into the pasture. That's the picture Jesus has here. And he starts actually with this reminder that there are thieves and robbers who are really not the true shepherd. They don't care for the sheep. The shepherd is the one who comes in legitimately, comes right up to the door. The watchman recognizes him and the sheep recognize him. There aren't any underhanded motives. You know, in this passage, Jesus is actually speaking to the Pharisees who have kept questioning his authority, especially in the healing of this blind man in chapter 9 of John. And so he's, he's continuing this dialogue and saying, you aren't even able to hear. You don't even care what is going on with the people. This shepherd in Jesus' picture comes right up to that night watchman and the gates open to him. And how does this shepherd prove himself as being true, not some charlatan out to gain something for himself? Well, you see it there, that the sheep listen to his voice. They know his voice. There's an immediate recognition when the shepherd speaks. And he proves himself by calling the sheep by name. He knows the sheep, just as the sheep know him. And then it says, he goes out ahead of them. He leads them forth. You know, this is no stranger in this picture. This is a shepherd who is very intimately caring for his flock. The sheep in Palestine were largely kept for wool, not for meat. And so a shepherd would be connected to his flock over many, many years and probably would give them nicknames, be aware of their unique characteristics. They came to know and to trust his voice. This was close up knowledge of the sheep. And so they were ready to follow. So what is Jesus saying about himself in this first part, verses two to five? Well, it's this, Jesus is the one who has authority to care for his flock. He comes straight into our lives and over the years, we become more and more familiar with his voice. As he goes on ahead of us, we recognize it's trustworthy. He's proved himself trustworthy. So that's one picture that Jesus has, a pastoral picture in this, in this um, scripture this morning. But he also has another one starting in verse 7. And this is where we hear the I am statement. Because now Jesus says, I'm not just the shepherd coming to the gate. He says, I am the gate. He offers himself in another way to help us understand his relationship to the sheep, his relationship to us. You know, the sheep are, at this scene, might have been in a different scenario. They might have been out in the fields during the warmer season when they were 
not coming into the village at night in this communal sheepfold, but staying out in spaces outdoors. And they would go to these semi-open spaces with walls and one opening, but no door, no gate to lock or unlock. And in that place, the shepherd himself would lie down at night in that opening, lie across it so though no sheep would get out and no predators would get in. And Jesus is saying, I not only know my sheep and lead them out, but I'm the gate, the door that makes them secure and fulfills whatever the sheep need. You see, the shepherd has the well-being of the sheep at heart rather than even his own life. So I've been thinking some characteristics of a gate and how they relate this I am of Jesus. First of all, a gate gives access. You know, we can come in and go out of a gate, a door, and Jesus is saying, I, only I, I'm the only way in. I'm the only way into the fold of God. And I'm, only, I'm also the only access out into true life, into pasture that is fulfilling. The reminder is that those who enter are saved. And those who go out do so in security. God's going to provide for them. The shepherd's going to care for them. All their needs are supplied. Just as it says in Psalm 23, I don't have, you know, no needs. I have no wants because the Lord is my shepherd. Verse 9 says, whoever enters, whoever enters through me, Jesus said, will be saved. You know, the first picture we had of the sheep, it was more a um, relative description of a shepherd but in this section verses 7 through 10 Jesus is saying I me mine he's making it very explicit that this is about me and so when he says I'm the access point I'm the gate of the sheep we 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 declare with him there is no other way to enter into the Christian life except through Jesus Christ and when we do enter, we have access to full life as we trust his word and follow his lead. Jesus, he's the gate, the gate of access. But there's another thing that gates do, and that is they protect, a gate of protection. We see all throughout this passage that there are thieves and robbers who have different ideas about the sheep. They come to steal to kill, to destroy. Now, a gate provides protection. There's that shepherd, picture it again, lying across the entrance, his own body laid out to preserve the life of those inside the fold, to keep at bay those who would come in and steal and destroy the sheep. You know, that's what he was saying about the Pharisees. And can be said about many leaders today, both in the church and outside of the church, that there are those who seek their own way, who don't have the welfare of the sheep in mind. They use underhanded ways to get things for themselves with no regard for the well-being of the sheep. Jesus says, I am the gate of protection. I protect you from the devil, from the schemes of the evil one, I protect you from other leaders, worldly schemes that might maybe seem sincere, but lead you astray and end in death and destruction. Jesus' commitment to us as the shepherd is to lay down his life so we're protected. Our lives are saved. So it's a gate of access. It's a gate of protection. And Jesus also is a gate of belonging. I love this part of the passage. It's really kind of looking back at verses two to five because we long to be known and have a place where we are known. And that is what Jesus invites us into, belonging to God's flock. 
as the gate for the sheepfold, he says, these are my own. These are my sheep. I, I call them by name. We are not some random, random, faceless people in God's kingdom, in God's flock. You and I, we are known and we are loved and we belong. And no stranger can tell us that we don't belong or try to pull us away with false promises. No, we hold to what Jesus says about us. We belong to him. His voice reminds us we belong. Jesus is the door into belonging. Jesus says it this way. A leader that can be trusted completely, a true shepherd is one who says, I offer access, protection, and belonging. And Jesus says it explicitly about himself. I am the gate. Through Christ, you and I are offered access to God, protection from evil, and belonging in his family. So we come back to where we started. Who can you trust? Can Jesus' word be trusted? Has he proved himself to be true to what he says? You know, these aren't questions we just ask once. As we consider, there are a lot of competing voices that beckon us, both in our own minds, in the culture around us, and we recognize it, that Satan tries to pull us away from this good and true shepherd, to doubt that Jesus is good or that he's looking out for our well-being. So let me just have you consider a few things as you hear these words of Jesus this day. Do you know his voice? You may be one of those who needs to familiarize yourself more deeply into the words of your shepherd. That may mean spending time in God's word because he never contradicts what he said about himself in the word. It may mean learning to listen and wait in prayer, not to just talk all the time to God through Jesus Christ, but to stop and listen and notice what comes to your mind and heart. And check it out. Is this from you, Lord? Are you speaking to me? You might need to ask another Christian friend or um, someone to mentor you in the way of listening to Jesus. Because he wants us to know his voice. And when we recognize and know his voice, we follow with confidence. Or maybe you're one who have never entered that gate of access to Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus invites everyone, he says, whoever comes, to find salvation and life through him. And if you have not made Jesus a part of your life, it's as simple as saying yes to him and as life-altering as giving up your whole life in his pursuit. If you've never walked through the gate of access to Jesus Christ and to life in him, I invite you to do so today. You can pray that prayer just now. Jesus, I want to believe. And if you want to know more about access to God and what life in him is like, oh, please email me or one of the pastors. You can just email us at pastors at plcc.org. Because we would love to share with you more about what it means to have access to God through Jesus Christ. It is also this gate of belonging, as we talked about. And today, we together will celebrate one of the greatest pictures of belonging through the gift of communion, this sacrament we share together. I want you to look again at that picture we started with. These Ethiopian believers sitting at a table of belonging with Christ in the center. This is what we're invited to. A God who knows us, who knows our name, and who welcomes us at the table and says, I would lay down my life for you. In fact, I have laid down my life so that you could have life. 
You belong at the table. So whether you attend our drive through later today or receive communion in your own home, we are joining into this community of belonging. This gate we go into the fold of God with people around the world and we remember Jesus' commitment to us. He invites you and I to remember. I am the gate, he says. I am the gate of the sheepfold and through me you have access to God, protection from evil and belonging in God's family. I pray that is true for you today and you will walk in it in the week ahead. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, your words are true. More than every, any leader we've ever heard, we can trust that what you say about yourself and what you say about us is true. We hold fast to that truth that you are the shepherd who welcomes us into your fold, who gives us access to God. What an incredible gift and who protects us from things that would draw us astray. Thank you, God. And I pray for my brothers and sisters and all those who are joining us online that we would know you as the gate of the sheep and that we would not be led astray by those who try to steal, kill, and destroy. You are shepherd. You are good. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, 
receive this blessing. May you go into this day and into this week knowing that the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, knows your name. You can follow him with confidence. Go in peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a reminder for anyone that's newer to Pine Lake Covenant Church, we would love to connect with you. So just grab your phone and text the word WELCOME to 425-249-3838. Now we have a fun event coming up for all our children and families. So I want you to save this date. It's Saturday, April 3rd from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. It's our Easter hop. We're going to have fun games and we'll have crafts and treats and, of course, an egg hunt. And it's all outdoor and socially distanced. So to find out more or to sign up, just go to plcc.org slash hop. Hey, everybody. Scott here, and it is time for drive through Communion. You know, over the last few months, I've been working really hard perfecting my strategies. So far, I have figured out the best way to get the perfect place in line. And then I've also figured out the do's and don'ts of testing out your equipment to make sure it's in tip top shape. Ready for communion? Done with communion. Ready for communion? Done with communion. Oh, uh, oh, no. That's right though, I love fresh air. <laughs> And now, this week, I have been working on my driving skills. I mean, it is called drive through communion. There's a pastor. Whoa, pastor. Woo! Whoa, look at pastor. There's a the pastor. Oh, sorry, Pastor Mark. So yeah, I think I'm ready. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to see you there. It's from 1130 to 1230 today at church. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you soon. Welcome to the table. This table is a place where we are each freely invited to come and to receive the gift of life. Through simple elements like bread and juice, these simple elements yet this profound reality that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we come to receive to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And so uh, I hope you've had the chance to gather really any elements that you have in your home, some juice or some bread or really whatever you have to receive today. And as you do, I invite you to hear these words and then I will pray for us and then you're free to uh, receive these elements at your convenience. Again, whether you're with someone or whether you're by yourself, we each are in our own different spaces and places, and yet we come to the same table to receive this gift freely that is life through Jesus Christ. And so hear these words. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples at a table, and he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after dinner, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. Take, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
And so, Lord, as we receive these elements today, may we not just receive a bread and some juice as a symbol, but may it become a reality in each of our lives that we have life because of your sacrifice. And so may we go from this table and this place proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Would you receive these elements now at your convenience?